Thank you. Can I uh, welcome everybody here today for this very important session, uh, which is being put on by Bevan in conjunction with the Welsh NHS Confederation. And I'm delighted to have Darren Hughes here as a co-chair. I will chair the first part of this and he will take over and chair the second part. If I could just remind everybody who is on here that they should be on mute um, and we hope that there's no change to that anyway. The technology should make sure that happens. Please do put in your questions uh, because Darren in the second half will be picking up questions and they will go into the chat function. Please, when you do, remember that the chat function um, is if you like a public document and uh, could be called down. So please uh, make sure that you put in constructive comments and constructive questions. Uh, the context for the event, of course, you've just seen in that film, uh, which is really quite startling with the numbers, what's been happening. And I don't think it's until some time further on that we will look back and realize just how massive the upheaval of this pandemic has actually been on every aspect of our lives. Uh, but obviously in health and social care, we now have a workforce which is clearly uh, exhausted. And we have a population who've had to rethink all of their attitudes and have come to go from what they always thought was certainty to recognizing that actually we're living with uncertainty all the time, that we never know uh, if you like where the next blow might be coming from 
um, and that things are in fact unpredictable um, and constantly changing. We have a panel for our interviews um, today. And if I can just start telling you a tiny little bit just to put the context around each person. Um, as I said, Darren, uh, who is co-chairing this, is the director of the Welsh NHS Confederation and previously was director for Wales at the General Pharmaceutical Council and head of office at the GMC, General Medical Council, and also a member of Citizens Advice Cymru Advisory Committee and chairs Welsh Government's Pharmacy Delivering a Healthier Wales Delivery Board. Uh, we also have with us Camilla Hawthorne MB, who's a Bevan Commissioner, as I am myself, and she's head of the Graduate Entry Medicine Programme at Swansea University Medical School and is a GP and an elected member of the Council of the Royal College of General Practitioners. I'm delighted too to be able to welcome Len Richards, who's Chief Executive of Cardiff and the Vale University Health Board. Before coming to us, he had been Deputy Chief Executive of South Australia Health and has a long uh, history in service transformation programs and innovation and leading and delivering healthcare management, working in partnership with others. And we also have Jules Godden, who's a Bevan advocate, patient carer, and education program for patients coordinator at an RM Bevan University Health Board. Uh, as well as all of this, she's a professional para-athlete, having competed for Wales and Great Britain on numerous occasions in dressage. And then we have David Hepburn, also from an Iron Bevan University Health Board, who is the clinical director of intensive care um, during the first wave of the COVID pandemic. And he is now overseeing undergraduate medical education at the new Grange Hospital and has a specific interest in medical simulation and improving communication in medicine. So uh, with that, I'm going to go straight over to our panel and throw them really the first question, uh, which is what are the tough choices that we need to make in the light of COVID-19 to address demand and the need and supply across healthcare. And I would remind everybody listening that need and demand aren't necessarily the same thing. So perhaps uh, as the front line who the patients come to see, can I start with Camilla? Thank you. Um, yes, it has been, general practice is definitely, definitely not closed. Um, it's very busy. Um, interestingly, we are um, consulting mainly on the telephone, not on video, although there are now e-consultations and patients um, send in photographs um, uh, quite quite a bit, which is also very helpful. And I have been astonished how much can be done virtually that I wouldn't have thought possible before. Um, but of course, there are going to need to be um, some big choices as to how we continue with that. Um, you know, face-to-face -face consulting is still important. There are some things that you have to do uh, with a patient rather than over the telephone or on a video. Um, and uh, we also are going to need to train um, all of our healthcare workers on um, developing good um, communication skills using this new medium of communicating because it's not the same thing as consulting with somebody on a face-to-face -face basis. We know that continuity of care is the way in which patients relate to their healthcare professionals and their, their doctors and GPs in my case, does seem to matter. It does have better health outcomes if there is good continuity of care. And we're going to need to ensure that we don't lose the baby with the bathwater um, as things change back. Um, so I, I and many others foresee that up to 50% of our consultations will remain virtual. Um, but there will certainly be a lot more face-to-face -face consultations than there are currently. I think your question was about tough choices, wasn't it? Um, yes, it was really. And, and I think linked to that, Camilla, the comment that you just made about 
things going back or perhaps they won't ever go back and we need to take the silver linings from the black clouds of the pandemic and say how do we build on those two over to you so i think you know this is also an opportunity it's an opportunity to think about change it's interesting that the government in england seems to have taken that opportunity with their announcement this morning although i think they've missed some important opportunities um, what we've seen from COVID is the devastating impact it's had on social care and on people who are affected by social care and in need of social care. And, you know, this is now an opportunity to properly integrate health and social care instead of just talking about it. And that does mean integrating at not just at a funding level, but also in a training and a staffing level. Uh, so that to some extent, this is an opportunity to reset our values and our principles as to how we go forward. And that needs to be done very collaboratively with the public as well as with the, the professionals involved. Um, the whole operational framework, I think, uh, may need to be rethought. It is an opportunity to do this. And you might say, well, my goodness, I've got enough to do right now without doing all this as well. But I think that um, this is the time to do it rather than doing it in a year or two's time, by which time it will be too late. Um, and we ought to think about not doing just what, again, the English government is talking about building back better, but doing what Michael Marmot talks about, which is building back fairer. Because one of the other things that we've seen is about COVID attacks, um, people who are have less privileges, people who are poorer, people who have chronic conditions, people who are frailer, people from BAME backgrounds, all of those have been far worse hit than those of us that come from um, well um, healed middle class background. So this is the time to make some changes. And can I then go from the community doctor to the hospital doctor? So David, um, can I go to you and ask you what you feel are the tough choices that we will need to make and how we'll address this? Yeah, I think that, that there needs to be a bit of bravery um, in terms of deciding which services are essential and actually bring them up to scratch as well. So I think this is not just about, um, you know, saving money and, and slimlining some of the waste, but it's also about identifying areas that need to be improved and actually not just accept, expecting them to improve organically over time, but actually forcing them to improve by, you know, a proper cash injection. I mean, speaking from the point of view of, of secondary care and from an ITU viewpoint, you know, we're a very expensive area, a bed, a bed day in ITU is a very expensive um, resource. Um, although actually we are, we do give relative value for money when you see the gains that we that we sometimes get with people. Um, but, you know, flow in the hospital really hinges on the capacity of critical care. A lot of things um, hook onto that. So elective surgery, major surgery, and all that throughput when critical care gets jammed up the rest of the hospital slows down to a crawl um so you know if we one of the things we've been looking at is is the demand of the unmet need and it's projected that that you know there's about a four to five percent um increase in in unmet need every year in wales um, for, in critical care but the investment's been static for approximately the last 20 years um certainly up to 2019 you know, there were less critical care beds in wales than anywhere else in Western Europe, I think we were at about 5.7 per 100,000, which, you know, the, the UK itself is about 7 per 100,000 and Europe is about 12 per 100,000. And we've seen that actually, you know, in preparing for the pandemic, if, if, if we'd ex there was a conservative estimate that we should have expanded our bed base by about 73 over the last five years, which unfortunately didn't happen. But actually, if we had done that, then we would have not surged out as we have done in many hospitals. And that, and you wouldn't see this big knock on effect on, on, on other services as well. So I, I do think that, that, you know, planning for the future and, and using money sensibly um, to, to meet the, the demand and the need is probably is, is the way to go, to be honest. Len, can I turn to you now, the person who's got to integrate it? And uh, I think the, the figures that have come out just today for the UK of emergency departments just shows that they are completely falling over again ambulance weights are going up and you, uh, david spoke about flow through the hospital and of course it's not only flow in but it's flow out no ab Len. absolutely and thank, th thank you um for bringing me in on on that I, I guess i'd just like to comment on a couple of things um 
when I when I look back on the pandemic, I, I see it very much through the the lens of health inequalities. I think it plays to um, some of the points that Camilla said. Um, I think this pandemic has really highlighted the lack of progress that we've made as a health system around inequalities. And it comes to your point around demand and need. We try our very best and have tried our very best to meet demand. I don't think we've tried as hard as we can. And I don't think we've made the progress that we should have made to really respond to need within the communities. And so those those people in the lower socioeconomic groups, those people from minority ethnic groups, I think find it difficult to access our services and therefore those inequalities uh, uh, grow and we've certainly seen them grow uh, going forward uh, throughout the pandemic. My sense is we've really got to think hard about what we set as our priorities for the NHS and, and let's get behind that, that idea of closing health inequalities, really equalising and responding to need not just responding to demand and that requires a whole mindset change at government level at service level um, right throughout the nhs and i think that's the tough choice that we've got to make what is it we're here to do and how are we going to respond um, to that just a, a couple of other things um i i think I, I again i'd agree with david i think we were caught uh, there was a shortfall we were caught with a shortfall in our nhs around critical care facilities we were caught with a shortfall around um, bed capacity around a number of different things that we really need to get on top of so that we are in a position to respond now that doesn't mean that we need another 220 critical care beds because we use that many extra in the pandemic but it does mean that we should have responded to the 73 uh, that were planned and that were that should have been in place because that would have minimized um, our position so I, I also think there's a shortfall in our capability around digital so we have responded marvelously I think through the pandemic around virtual clinics and that sort of thing but it has put unprecedented sort of challenges in our digital infrastructure because again there was a shortfall going into this pandemic so I think there are things that we can be better prepared for going forward and again those choices will require investment and if we're investing in some things we will have to choose those in in advance of others so again tough choices uh, to be made and then the third thing and i'll do this quickly um we've seen that we need to separate um elective scheduled services from emergency services in the outpatient setting we've done that through the virtual um, approach we've been able to separate uh, that out but you can't do that on some of our surgical operations etc so we've got to really invest in our sites to create protected surgical areas so that we can protect people from the potential of infection through infection prevention and control and ensure that those surgical uh, cases are done in a safe environment as well as being able to handle and cope with the unscheduled the emergency demand going forward. Thank you. And Jules, now bringing you in, you've heard what's been said already. I'm sure you've got your own ideas as well. Yeah, I mean, I look at it from a completely different perspective. I look at it from um, more of a patient side. I've been a patient for a very long time um, for my health and I'm also full time carer, as, as we just said. But I think a lot of everything that can be um, laid at the base is patient education. Um, because of COVID being right at the forefront and being on the news and being in the papers, patients have actually had a more active role. We've had patients that have been asking us for, you know, working with us for ages that have said about waiting lists and about how they're not getting access and how they thought things could change. And with this more virtual platform, a lot of patients are getting a lot more, um, a lot more reassurance. They're getting through to um, GPs and um, consultants a lot easier. And also, I think that having the patients seem to be having a bigger voice than they were before 
if anything, I think people are listening to the patients and patients are wanting to learn. And the more the patients learn, the more that they can be active in this. And then that's going to to help with the situation that we find ourselves in. That's what we're kind of finding. Patients really want to know more about what they can do to help with the NHS system and how they can work better within it. Thank you, Jules, and I'm glad you brought up about patients being listened to because I'm also hearing uh, just generally <laughs> that people feel that actually despite all of the visors and the masks or perhaps because of the effort made, communication is better uh, with patients and that, the, that people are really making a bigger effort to communicate but of course, there has also been the problem of no visitors going in. But it may be that in that loneliness of being in an inpatient, the staff in recognising that have taken on a more personally communicative role uh, with them. And I just wonder, Camilla, can I go back to you and some of the things that Len said? How do you think we move from that old fashioned primary care versus hospital kind of divide that we had where the referral went in and it went through some kind of holding process, which just meant that it was all gummed up? Are we at the point now that we've learned that everybody with a clinical training should be back in uniform doing clinical work? that we slim right down on the bureaucracy, we increase the frontline clinical, and we make access between primary and secondary care much more rapid and much more personal? I think that would be wonderful if that happened. Um, I, I don't actually see it happening yet, um, despite COVID, uh, various bits of bureaucracy have been pushed to one side um, and have made life easier. Um, but the, the sort of basic referral system still applies. I feel very sorry for patients, actually, because I feel that many, many of the things that we do are for our convenience, not necessarily for patients' convenience. And we need to be thinking much more about putting the patient at the centre of it. And how do you make a streamlined process that makes somebody who may not be very health literate um, may find it much easier than to access help um, as a GP? I spend a great deal of my time chasing referrals, chasing the results of um, tests that have been done by secondary care specialists because patients don't know what's happening to them and it can go on for months and months and months. And I think, you know, we, we're going to take a long time to get over this. I think it may be years before we're actually over this properly. Um, and we do need to find ways to help patients um, along their health journeys. Um, rather better than we've done in the past and um, all one sees at the moment is people who've got say, knees or hips being asked to wait even longer than they had to wait before COVID in order to be sorted. So we do need to think of ways in which we can actually help um, ease that and get things moving for the people who, so that the people who need it most get treated first. Um, and, we, and we do things in a logical and as quick and efficient a way as possible. So just as a quick example, in general practice, at the moment in Wales, we don't have electronic prescribing. I spend 40 minutes to an hour every day just signing prescriptions. It's a terrible waste of time, terrible. And it couldn't be that difficult to make it happen. You just need somebody up there to make it to say, do it, and I'm sure it would happen. So, so there's one really kind of quick wins simple straightforward and safer because the electronic prescribing probably will decrease errors as well and incompatible prescribing uh, can i pick up on your point though about you having to chase up results and ask jules have we moved to the point now where we should be saying to patients you carry your own record you carry your own results and that we've been overprotective of patients even though there will be some people who find it a shock to have on their record what is on their record i think absolutely it's something that um during the courses that we run we run a section and it's called um 
what the problems you have with your healthcare professionals and what are some of the problems that you have with the healthcare system. Um, every single time it comes up that patients can sometimes go to hospital and they've no idea, the consultant's got no idea why they're there, they don't get the test results, the patients aren't informed enough about what it is that they're, they're having their tests for. Um, for example, with myself going um, in and out of different hospitals, I was at Nerville Hall, uh, the Gwent and Royal Glamorgan, I would insist that I took my notes with me so that at least when I got to where I was going, that person knew exactly why I was there, what test I was supposed to have, and it cut down the time that we were in hospital. During that session, when we asked patients, every single time patients said, if I had my notes and I was better informed, then I could let the healthcare professional know exactly why and what I was there for, and that would cut down on all of the waiting and the lost results. So I don't know what the issue is. It, it would seem a really good, uh, straightforward, simple idea. If you go from the GP um, and you're admitted to um, through accident and emergency to go as an inpatient and you're taken, you take a letter with everything that you need with you, hand it over when you get there and then they know what's going on. So what's the difference? <laughs> Len, I saw you nodding away. Your comments. Oh, so, no, Jules, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I think the days of, of, of us being paternal, in a sense, and, and looking after those notes for people, I think those are, are far, they, they should be far gone days. Mm. There are lots of systems out there that would enable um, the, the, the hospital to share the results and to give the results to the, the patient so that they had their own record of the care that they were getting and and of the, the diagnostic results and, and all of those sorts of things. We just need to get on with it. I mean, I, 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 I'm sometimes staggered at the lack of progress that we make in these sorts of areas. Um, I know that we have a number of uh, systems that we are piloting in different specialties that do engage with the patient and give them their results. And what we find every single time we do that is that the patient takes more ownership of their own condition, starts to manage themselves yeah. much better, starts to tell the clinicians what it is they think they need and then there's a debate between clinical staff and patient about the next steps rather than the the, the more traditional relationship um, which I, I, I've sort of highlighted as being paternal which I think we've got to lose so I couldn't agree with you you more Jules we need to make those changes and get those systems in place and David, you and I have been around and had some of these discussions from the other end as well with some of our colleagues who are more resistant and throw up concerns. How do you think we can change the attitude amongst our colleagues that actually the patient arriving uh, or who knows what their biochemistry has been doing or whatever might actually make looking after them easier? Absolutely. And I think, we, you know, particularly with patients with chronic health or long term health conditions, we do find that they are getting much better informed about their care. They know what their baseline creatinine or what their kidney function is doing. And they'll they'll tell you that. And it's super helpful. But I would just like to pick up on something that Len said. You know, it, there are a lot of systems in place in Wales that do some of this. They you know, scrabble together piecemeal. Most of the hospitals have now got some sort of computerized radiology. Most of them have got a computerized results system. Um, but wouldn't it be amazing if those things have all obviously all developed in a, in a vacuum, but wouldn't it be amazing if we had a unified system that put not only to allow patients to access it, but to allow every professional that comes in contact with you access to a truly electronic health record, which would integrate everything from the general practitioners to the intensive care unit, to yeah, everyone in the community and also allow people access to their own record. I mean, that, that's got to be the dream and the goal eventually, because there are, you're right, Len, we could probably find a bit of each system in each hospital that does all these things, but getting them all to talk to each other and getting them all to actually, you know, work at the point of care and not be glitchy and, and to run on an established standard. Um, you know, this was a, probably a, a problem, the seeds of which were sown 20 years ago when the individual hospitals started their IT systems and nobody actually had the sort of 
presence of mind to say, hang on a minute, we're all doing the same thing here. Can't we have a common language? Um, but I think that's the future. It's also the future for research as well. You know, we're moving to an, the intensive care units in Wales now are moving to an electronic health record in terms of electronic um, data collection as well. So every blood pressure, every blood gas sample we do, every every oxygen saturations every five minutes. These at the moment, they're populated on a huge chart by the ITU nurses by hand. This will all be done and captured digitally, which will save up a huge amount of nursing time, but it will also give us access to an enormous, enormous data set. And those huge data sets you can look at with big, you know, AI driven systems. And actually you can you can discover all sorts of amazing things that, you know, when you once you feed these systems enough data that actually will improve patient care going forward. But it, it really will take some absolute bravery and unfortunately a fair injection of money to actually get us fit for the next you know hundred years from an IT point of view. And I guess the danger, if it isn't properly invested in, is that it will not be secure enough. So it would be hackable and um, people could either corrupt it or um, could steal someone's identity. Uh, so the security absolutely. around it will, will, will be absolutely massive. And there were moves some time ago to discuss patients actually just carrying have it in a way that they are they have their own backup on a little pen drive or whatever, um, or a, one of those little credit cards that they keep in their wallet, which has got their information stored. But again, there are security concerns with that and with PIN numbers and for people who've got chaotic lives, how they manage to remember what PIN to put in where. I don't know if any of you got any thoughts on those which have been thrown up as downside arguments from time to time. Well, we're, we're all carrying, I, you know, a huge amount of encryption in our pockets, most of us now. And so, you know, these are, these are, there are, you know, I can get into my internet banking. It's very secure. It uses my face, um, you know, so that the solutions are there. Sorry, Len. Can I, yeah, can I, can yeah. I just come in on that? Because I, I think, I think we overplay those issues that you've just talked about. I, David's just demonstrated, you know, we carry it around with us every day really personal data that is very important to us individually and we download it on our phone protect it within our phone and use it i th i think we are as a, as a system too cautious about um the the protection of that of course we've got to protect the data of course we can't be hacked and mustn't be hacked and and all of those things but but my view is that um that we use that as an excuse to keep the data too secure, too tightly within the center, and we exclude people who need that data, patients particularly, from getting it and being able to have it, because in actual fact, it's their data, not ours, Is it would be my view. So I, I think somehow we've got to try and tread a very good line down that, and, and, and I think we err on the side of caution. Our risk appetite is very low on that. I'm going to ask Camilla for a very short comment because she's been itching to come in and then I'm going to move on to another question. So I've seen this in action in Italy, in the Bergamo area of Italy with a credit card system um, and uh, actually on an ITU in a new hospital there in Bergamo. Um, and it's um, you, if they can do it in Italy, why can't we do it here? Absolutely. And I don't know if you could say that in Italian for us too, Camilla. <laughs> but I think now the next question, and you've spoken about um, hips and knees and so on. What about this backlog and managing expectations and how do we help patients not only manage while they're waiting, but actually improve their health while they're waiting so before they go in? through surgery, for example, they've lost weight, they've improved their lung function, they've stopped smoking and they've cut down their alcohol, amongst other things. Um, Jules, have you got any thoughts about what we can do? You're very involved in patient education already. I think the biggest thing is to treat patients like people. Um, give them the tools to be able to manage and they'll manage pretty well. Again, like talking about, the, you know, about this occurring information just now. Um, give especially long-term patient, long-term conditions patients, they know more about their condition than anyone else, they're experts. 
they wouldn't be worried about carrying any form of information because they know that would help. I think that one of the biggest problems um, that we have in this country is communication. We know there's going to be backlogs as patients. We're not we're not stupid. We know that there's a situation. But be honest, this is how long it's going to take before you can be seen. This is the reason. And these are things you can do in the meantime. Nobody minds who's been on an automated phone and you've no idea could be on there for hours. If they say your number so and so and this is roughly how long it's going to take, you don't feel so stressed out about it. So be honest with patients. Explain there's a backlog. Tell them the reasons. Tell them how long estimated that it's likely to be and stay in communication. And I think then patients do keep up that good work. They know to work towards their diet goal. They know to think about their alcohol and their smoking and their lifestyle choices. And they know that they need to do that in a certain time period in order to get the best result. I think it's just communication. Yeah, thank you. Len, you looked as if you were itching to come in. No, oh, absolutely. And, and again, agree entirely with Jules. Um, treat people like adults. Um, give them the truth about what's what's happening. Um, but then coming back to those waiting lists, I think there, there is an awful lot that, that pe people can be involved in whilst they are waiting for something to improve their health. So prehabilitation is the, the, the sort of word that we use to describe it. Rehab in preparation for surgery or treatment and that sort of thing. And I think the, 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 the advances that we've made in digital as well um, will enable prehabilitation to be delivered in a better way um, than we'd first envisaged with people coming into gyms and that sort of thing. We can give advice, give support, keep in regular contact around how, how individuals health is progressing but at the same time encourage healthy lifestyle encourage healthy eating encourage um, uh, exercise uh, physical exercise so that they are prepared for the treatment um, that they're waiting for and i think uh, going back to things we've learned in the pandemic the number of people who have taken up some kind of physical exercise in their own home in their living rooms and done so safely has been, I think, really impressive. And every day the media seem to have a different set of exercises for you to try. Um, so that's helpful. But Camilla and David, at you're at the clinical end. Are you seeing that or is that just simply those of us that have watched breakfast TV this morning? So I see um, definitely um, more people, particularly in the first lockdown, um, did go out more. They ran, they walked, they took their dogs out. Um, seems to be less this time round. And this time round, maybe in, in South Wales where I'm working, because the um, influence of COVID has been so much worse this time round than with the first surge, I think there's quite a lot of fear and many people are afraid to go out. Um, and I'm spending yes. a lot of time encouraging people to go out. Um, I think that there are um, a lot of people suffering from various types of stress and anxiety and worse mental health problems. And we're going to have to think about, you know, people's um, mental health as well as their physical um, and social health. Um, you know, we really have to be thinking of people in a holistic way. I think there's no doubt I've seen communities come together and respond in marvellous ways and that is something that we mustn't lose. We need to pick it up. Um, I know there are people who have dropped it in their sites and we've dropped that ball um, and that we, we make the most that we can from it. In terms of waiting lists, I think we do need ways of making sure that we can prioritise so that the people who need it most get seen quicker. Um, but also there's a lot of wastage in the whole system and we need ways of being able to look through systems. A lot of people, even by the time you get to them, may not need to be seen anymore. Um, and that needs to be dealt with um, in, in a more streamlined and efficient, efficient manner. Yeah. Uh, and I was just wondering, as you were talking about people not going out, whether we ought to be simply saying that you wear a mask at all times as has happened in some countries in Europe and whether that makes it easier because if you've got a mask on whenever you go out the front door then 
oddly enough, that helps people be distance aware and yeah. the two meter rule and all that goes along with it. And I think the days of the kind of kissy kissy greeting are over, probably. Um, David, do you want to come in with anything? I, th I think um, looking at it, it, what Camilla said about community health. I mean, this is this is really the chickens coming home to roost now, isn't it? That with the health of the community. I mean, certainly the, uh, a lot of the patients that we're seeing are are relatively young um, in their fifties, and they are the product of communities which have you know there's been a huge amount of health health inequality. I think anything that can pull people up and and, and try and improve the community health, and but health of the community is is it's not just about people getting to see their GP or getting into secondary care. It has to it start, it should start at school. You know, it's it's absolutely every level from public health, primary care, secondary care, care um, schooling, education. I mean, it, it really does have to be all pervasive in the community. And I don't know, it's gonna take some very ambitious changes to, to improve the, the health of our communities, which are, you know, we know that there is a huge difference between in life expectancy if you live in the Gurnos or if you live in Radha. In Cardiff, you know, for every mile you go up the, the the road up the valleys, there's a 25 year difference between, you know, the, the life expectancy of a, of a man in the Gurnos is about 58, 58.8, I think, average. I've got it written down here. And in Radha, it's 83 and 83 years and four months. So there's that's a huge, huge amount. And, and that is not going to be something that's fixed quickly. But I think the, 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 the whole future of the country really is for Wales is is all about trying to sort out that inequality. Do, do you think our political system of uh, people worrying about votes and therefore finding it difficult to, if you like, give the bad news, which is this is what you've got to do versus the perception that this is what we can do for you uh, in the electoral cycle actually works against some of those public health messages um i just put um, that out as a thought really as, a, as somebody who's politically independent and uh, who can't uh, but, in a general election so it's easy for me if, if you look at the icnarc data as well which is the intensive care um research data for, for the pandemic you know it's disproportionately it's you know the poorer communities that have suffered you know and i know that that in terms of death rate myrth is uh, one of the highest death rates in europe per capita per hundred thousand i think it's 320 per hundred thousand which is right up there with you know uh, above most other places so we've, it's, it's addressing the root causes of that but also some of this has to be about empowering the people of those communities and say to them you are at risk now because you, you know you are part of this community and you're in your 50s and you're overweight we tell people that this is the this is the reality of the situation we need to do something to you know you need to do something as well yourself to, to try and avoid this because you know i've just seen for the last three months a stream of, of people who would have lived another 20 or 30 years coming in and dying and it's been absolutely heartbreaking mm -hmm. and yeah, nutritionally as well there's a huge deficit yeah camilla we really need to hit at inequality, social inequalities, because they're the root cause of the health inequalities that we're seeing. And yeah. this, uh, yeah. you know, in a way that um, Hurricane Katrina did, do you remember, once Hurri Cat Hurricane Katrina yeah. had passed, who were the people who were left on the rooftops? They were the dispossessed, or the frail, yeah. the elderly, you know, um, and sorry, the BAME as well. Um, and yeah. This is not a hurricane. This is much longer than a hurricane and much worse. And we need to do something about it. Otherwise, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. So we're heading into our last 10 minutes now. So I'm going to ask each of you very quickly in a couple of minutes to tell me what you see as the top three, three things that we need to do differently. We've had lots of ideas pouring out here um, and very wide ranging as well across all parts of the sector. And I would, I'm going to ask for someone to volunteer to start this one. Who would like to kick us off? Should I go first? I'm quite happy to, yes, to give three. So, so I, th I, think, um, I think it's a huge opportunity going forward. I think we've, the, the NHS has been shaken. I think the country has been shaken, if not the world, yeah. uh, as a result of this um, pandemic. So we've really got to grab the things that did work well through the pandemic that we can be proud of, 
but then embed them and make them better than they were. So, so first of all, I'd say digital. Um, it has worked well, yeah. but it's been a it's been a point change. We've we we do clinics now virtually, and Camilla said um, at the beginning there is some sometimes that works well, sometimes it doesn't. And and what we've got to do is design our pathways, incorporating the um the advantages of digital and where it can work well use it to its maximum to make services um, more accessible um for patients so so i think i think maximizing the use of digital appropriately within the healthcare setting i think the second is outcomes not targets you know let's look at improving the outcomes for for communities for individuals not managing parts of the system because by managing parts of the system we create uh, unintended consequences and i think the the managing of waiting lists and and that sort of thing has has done that so again outcomes by driving really evidence-based pathways we will lead to better outcomes and let's be measured on the outcomes that we achieve and then the third thing and uh, is 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 around how the system works can we please just reduce the bureaucracy in the system so that we can create a system that is agile, can respond to the needs um, of, of its communities um, and that we don't get bound up in, in the bureaucracy that, that seems to add months and months and months to decisions that are pretty obvious decisions. Um, and through the pandemic, we did we made decisions quickly. We engaged with frontline clinical staff, worked with those frontline clinical staff and said, what is it we need to do so that you can do your job properly? And, and, and we made decisions and we did them. Let's keep that going because that's the route to a much more agile and much more responsive service. Great. Thank you, Len. Thanks for kicking them off. So I'm going to go over to Camilla because many of her patients, of course, aren't on one pathway. They've got multiple comorbidities and that can make it pretty complex, really. It's like a big railway system. Camilla. Yes, thank you. So um, I would say all of the above to uh, uh, what Len has said. But in addition, um, I think that we should. This is our opportunity to integrate health and social care properly and, you know, yeah. walk not just talk the talk. Uh, that's the first yeah. thing. The second thing I think is that we should be working much more closely with our communities at a locality level, actually identifying what their needs are and delivering on local needs because what somebody might need in Butte Town will be very different to what somebody needs in Mountain Ash. Um, I think we need to find and or create locality structures to deliver it and actually enact that Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. And we should be thinking prevention. We shouldn't be shutting the door after the horse is bolted. By the time a patient comes in to see me, who is very overweight with type 2 diabetes and hypertension and heart problems, yes, we can manage those conditions. We can. But wouldn't it have been better if we never developed them in the first place? And we know that these are preventable conditions. And we need to be getting out, as David was saying, into the schools, into the communities, into churches, church halls, other organisations um, as appropriate and um you know getting the whole community working together for their for themselves and for us for all of us really um and i think you know from a gp's point of view i think we should be boosting up the uh, locality clusters which is how primary care is organized in wales um, they already exist um, they could work very well one thing that i've seen covid do is a whole series of whatsapp groups have been set up per cluster and having initially, having watched the conversations in my local, local cluster, which started off moderately antagonistic and suspicious of each other, those GPs are now actually working together in a really nice way, very collaborative, very supportive, but they're not adequately funded. They're not given enough leadership opportunities. They're not given enough admin support to actually do anything um, that could be real abilities that they serve. So I think that that would be my third, my third thing. Great. And Jules, because we've had lots of talk about the community and you are there and today you're really representing community here. Jules, are you, are you at, we can't hear you. 
sorry i muted the cat was meowing um yeah i um although i run nhs courses in an iron bev and i sit within the third sector in um, voluntary organization and i I think that there should be much more communication between the health services and the third sector because they are on the front line, just as uh, Camilla said about, you know, we know the groups, we know the organisations that need the support. We work with the patients that need to get those services, that we need to get those services too. So having that more joined up approach of the health services working within the, with the third sector, I think is going to be a big support. I think that patients should be um, given more um, support to be able to voice how they would like to see a system working for them. I mean, we've touched on those subjects about patients being able to carry notes. Um, I think if patients were given a more active voice, then the relationships, especially with uh, chronic disease patients and the health services would be improved. Um, I also feel that if that was the case, then there would be less need for in-hospital treatments. And I think that would be beneficial. So they're my kind of three, but joined up. I'll give you an example. I've been wearing a brace on my leg for the past 15 years. I have to go backwards and forwards to hospital at the moment. And I see absolutely no need for me to do that when I can I know exactly how to fit a brace, how it should be used, what I need. Um, I can do measurements. I can do it all virtually. And if I wasn't sure, then let me make the decision on asking for the advice if I needed it. There's a there's an appointment that's freed up four appointments to hospital for something I don't need. We don't need all of these services in the hospitals. Phlebotanists could be working in the community take the patients out of the hospitals, have less um, have less patients then coming into um, areas where they can contract anything, C. diff, you know, norovirus, COVID. We're not in hospital, we're not going to get so sick. So take the services that don't need to be in hospital out of the hospital, put them in the community and give the patients a stronger voice. Yeah, great. And I love your example of your knee brace, because, of course, if you were ordering 10, the system would flag it up straight away that there's something funny going on. Uh, so, you know, why not entrust you with doing it? And David, who runs a department that nobody wants to end up in, I think. Go on. Over to you. I think, the, the you know, I'm fully agree with what everybody else has said to be honest um i think everybody's largely on the same page uh, it's it's astonishing how glacial the nhs is in terms of its its rate of change sometimes but actually it has shown us that it can be agile especially during the pandemic you know the walls the barriers were down and we were actually you know we were making huge leaps and bounds in terms of you know getting what we needed very very quickly um i think the other problem that we've got which is a systemic one is that it's the nhs is not a meritocracy often and there is there are no it, it's very difficult to, to find people who are doing really interesting and innovative things and, and bring them up and people get tend to get stuck in sort of minimum management level and then they get promoted until they stop and then they don't get any further um i think to being able to pick out people on the ground who are really making a difference and actually trying new things and actually say right you're a good you're an asset to us as a as a, as a unit as a department as a, as a health board um and finding some way to actually let the cream rise to the top rather than the bloated corpses that have been in the lake for so long um i think that would be a, a good thing i would echo what len says about digital i think that's probably the future in terms of cutting down some of the the waste and that's the other thing we everyone who works in the nhs is appreciative of how much waste there is but actually it needs someone to take it by the scruff of the neck and do something about it um and you know as jules was saying you don't need you know, re regular follow-up appointments we've got so many mechanisms now we, we can do video calling and we can do you know there are you, there is um consultant connect i believe in swansea bay and there's obviously e-prescribing now in in england which would be great over here and i think the other my third thing is that wales we are not the big lumbering english nhs we are you know we're the welsh nhs we're a separate entity we operate in a separate way we're smaller we're more manageable and actually there's a bit more of a community and people do know each other um you know obviously i've come across camilla when i was a medical student and she was a, a gp trainer and i've come across you prof um or baroness finley on a number of occasions throughout my career so it is a it is a small world 
And um, actually, we should. It does mean that bringing about change actually could be easier. Um, and so we should really the unique things that make the Welsh NHS what it is. We should really, really, you know, capitalise on them. I think as well. It's easier to make things happen in microcosm than in huge lumbering organisations. It's absolutely fantastic. You've been brilliant. I've loved the discussion. It's been re really stimulating, lots of ideas. And of course, taking those real movers and shakers is what we've been trying to do with our Bevan Exemplar projects of young people who've got brilliant ideas and help them develop those and grow them and move them on. But I would agree with you, David, we need to do it much more across the whole system. I'm now going to hand over to Darren Hughes, who's going to chair the audience session and he's going to take those questions that you've been putting in the chat. So I hope we can bring Darren up now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks very much to Laura and the panel for the contribution so far. I've really enjoyed it and a huge amount to go at for, for all of us. I work for the Welsh NHS Commission, who are the membership body for the uh, NHS organisations in Wales, the, the Health Boards, Trusts and Health Education and Improvement Wales. And it's a, a pleasure to be working with the Bevan Foundation at this uh, event this afternoon. Looking back at the video at the start of the event, some really stark figures there, the scale of the challenge that COVID has posed, the effects on communities, the effects on the economy. And I think one of the ones that sort of stuck with me and something we've been talking about a lot is the effect on uh, waiting lists and treatment going forward. And I think uh, Jules has touched on it, uh, David and Elora already, the need for effective communication. How do we manage expectations and take people with us? What's these new ways of working that we've been discussing? And I'll come to, to Camilla first, if that's okay. Ooh. Now, that's really quite a difficult question, isn't it? Because um, communication is key. And getting the communication right is also terribly important. Um, it seems to me that it's important to keep a, a consistent line, to keep a logical line that everybody can understand, um, not to um, go out one person saying one thing and another person saying another thing because that just causes terrible confusion um, of course we've all had to be very flexible with covid because it's behaved in ways maybe sometimes that we weren't expecting and you sometimes have to make new turns so if you have to make new turn, you have to explain why you have and what the reasons are rather than a bit fearing that you're going to be caught out by some um some newspaper reporter or somebody on the radio or telly uh, so I think communication is very, very important. It needs to be centrally managed carefully, um, but with um, ears at the grassroots level so that everybody knows um, what people are thinking. And, you know, then that picks up from the questions that people are asking so that you can then answer those questions rather than imagining what those questions will be. So I think, you know, and we've got so many different types of social media available at our fingertips now. We should be using them. We're not at the moment. No, thanks very much, Camilla. Len, come to you next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess uh, what I would add to um, what Camilla's uh, just said is I, I think our communications need to be tailored to the audience that we're trying to talk to. And that might, so in, in a sense, it, 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 it makes it more complex, but it makes it more relevant um, to, to those who we are trying to get uh, either messages or um, uh, yeah, messages across to. So it, it's how do we tailor it? Um, we, we sometimes fall back to generic comms generic approaches um yet and 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 again i think this is sometimes at the heart of some of those health inequalities and access type problems we communicate with people like ourselves um and 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 it makes perfect sense to us um yet we we need to communicate to all of the people who live within the communities that we're serving and and those communities are quite diverse those communities are are very different and therefore we've got to find approaches um that that make sense and are relevant to the people we are communicating with not that are easy for us as an organization to to deploy so so th that that's that's my sense of it um and um 
and and consistency of message yes we need the consistency but delivered in a way that gets the point across thanks very much then i, I agree 100 percent. i think of family members of mine if, it, if it's not in the slant server my grandfather doesn't think it's happening and i think yeah. we, we do forget that a lot of people haven't got access to electronic communication you know i, I agree with you on the methods of communication but any thoughts on actually the management of people's expectations what the messages should be around the challenge ahead facing the nhs so so again i i'd go back to what jules said at the beginning we need to treat people like adults we need to tell them what what the situation is we need to be very clear about the challenges that we're going to face over the next five years um and that that our um, focus of attention should be risk-based um and and but the, the, the progress that we make, we need to keep people involved in that so that people can see some light at the end of the tunnel um, around where they fit and when they will get their, the service that they require. And we need to communicate regularly on, on that basis because it will be a changing situation. Um, so, but, but it's honesty, transparency, and and I, I think the public will understand that the NHS has been under pressure and that the impact of coronavirus is a significant challenge going ahead uh, in terms of waiting people on waiting lists who haven't been seen um, for such a long time already, but that that will continue not to be seen. Um, and, and, and let's be open about it and have the debate as well about what the NHS can do over the next uh, three to five years, not what, not a return back to normal, because we're we're not in a normal situation at the moment. The number of patients on our waiting lists are significant. The number of patients that have waited far too long is a significant number. Um, we saw it in the in the video at the beginning. It's not something that we will sort out in a week. Thanks very much. Jules, I'll come to you next. And again, thoughts on, you know, how we communicate with patients most effectively, but also what we communicate. I think you gave some really good examples earlier, how pressure on the system is at the moment and things that you think might be able to, to be done about it. I think it's about not overcomplicating things. We know that, um, like in um, in Iron Berman, they do a Facebook post every single day giving out a dashboard of the figures and the numbers and what's going on um they're also email i mean i get an email every once a week every week saying about how many people have been vaccinated um that's also put up on facebook um anything that's going on can be done in that way we appreciate that not everybody has access so why not go the old-fashioned way and put a flyer through the door or a newspaper you know, these are the people that aren't going to have Facebook and, you know, the older generation. The older generation almost always have a newspaper if they can have one. They'll have the Argus or something like that. So why not go to the directly, take the direct message directly to the people because then they'll have a better understanding. They're not phoning every five minutes trying to work out what's going on because they'll have a better idea. I think when it comes down to communicating to people who are on waiting lists, maybe there should be a more joined up system that simply um, red flags anybody that um, has been on a list for a certain period of time and it automatically sends in, sorry about this, let me just get the cat off. That's one of your traditional oh. hazards of being at home. Um, so that if somebody's been on a waiting list for a period of time, then it red flags that. So automatically a letter is generated that says you've been on this waiting list for X amount of time. It apologises. It says roughly what sort of time period they should be contacted within. Um, and and it, even if you can't say your operation or your consultant appointment will be in this time, if you haven't heard within three months, we will be back in touch with you people would just appreciate a bit of honesty. It's a simple, in my opinion, communication form. Thank, no, thanks very much. I think that sort of clarity and, and consistency of message is a really good point. David, I'll come to you next. I think people have got used to, during the pandemic, healthcare being front page news. And it's literally front page news pretty much every day now. So I think that 
I'm hoping that people's understanding of the processes at work and also how busy we've been, apart from the odd few crackpots who don't believe anything's happening at all, I think the vast majority of the country realise what pressure the NHS has been under. So we could probably capitalise on that. that people are understanding and they do understand that this is a once in a lifetime occurrence, hopefully. Um, and I think I would echo what Len says. I think we need to be completely transparent with people and say, look, this is an absolute nightmare at the minute. We're stuck in a quagmire. It's going to take us a long time to get out. We're going to prioritise the people who need it the most. But the waiting list at the moment is four years or, or what have you. And I think, you know, you can still give people regular updates and let them know how they're getting on. And obviously, for certain procedures, there will always be the option of people you know, arranging it themselves, which, you know, I, I would be very reluctant to turn it into a two tier system, but there are going to be, there is going to be a role for all this, uh, in all this for private, for private providers. Uh, thanks very much, David. Can I, really, um, Dan, really... can I add something yeah. as well? Yeah. I think it's not just what we communicate, it's how we communicate it as well. And yeah. we've all seen a variety of different people communicating you know from all the different from the four different countries as well as from abroad and we all know um, some of the people who we consider we would trust and some of the people we wouldn't trust and it's it's really interesting um, but I think you know we do need to be very careful as to who uh, is selected to deliver a lot of this communicating it needs to be somebody who um, the public as a whole feel has integrity honesty somebody who will do everything he or she can to keep them safe and cares cares about them and that makes just such a big difference as to how a service runs i think that's that's a really good point there and you know work we've been doing with community health council similar messages people are aware of the challenges but are frustrated in the, the not knowing and the the way that they're communicated with i think some really good points about who does it as well. Apologies from me for referring to the, the meeting that's been organised by the Bevan Foundation at the start. I've had a telling off electronically, so apologies for that. <laughs> the next question uh, we've got is around the challenges we saw, the scale of the waiting list at the video at the start. Several people have alluded to it on the panel. Is there's going to be some tough choices have to be made in terms of clinical prioritisation uh, going forward and who gets care when and who doesn't? And I just, I'll come to do it in the opposite order to last time, if that's okay. David, I'll, I'll come to you first. I mean, this is a, it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, there is, there are obviously a huge panoply of things that we can do in the NHS that we have done in the past, which range from elective orthopaedics to, you know, breast augmentation to rhinoplasties to sinus surgery to open heart surgery to cancer care. Um, and, you know, the healthy current, health economists will know a lot more about this than, than I will but I think it's some we need to go through we need to go through what we can do with a fine tooth comb and actually work out what is giving us the, the a the best value for money b help the most people in the shortest period of time um, and again that all comes down to very complicated health economics that I'm sure Len understands a lot more than I do but in terms of qualities in terms of years of life you know without pain in terms of you know quality of life measures um, and I think to start with we need obviously prioritizing things like cancer surgery as the number one because if you don't operate on that you've only got a small window of opportunity and then you know it's too late um, and I think but everything thereafter um, actually needs to be looked at as, as you know what what wider effect does it do and 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 how does it help people and it's a very it's a tricky debate to get into that because you know who's to deny you know someone who's hobbling around their house waiting for a hip replacement doesn't care that the quality you know the quality of life data says x y or z they just want to be out of pain um and i think we we touched on this earlier on that, that providing alternatives as well um you know in terms of exercise regime support and also alternatives to things like you know chronic over medicalization in terms of painkillers and everything else which uh, you know can court spin into people into a much more difficult area of dependency too so um yeah it, i think it needs a real joined up approach and it's it can't just be the um the, the money pushes this needs to be the clinicians in terms of looking at the effectiveness and also talking to the community leaders and the patient groups to see actually what, what do we need to prioritise. Uh, thanks very much, David. Jules, come to you next. Yeah, I mean, I'm not medicalised, 
Um, but I do feel that, um, like I run the education programs for patients, we have a lot of patients that come to us um, from the pain clinics. Many of them aren't operating due to COVID, um, but we are getting a huge success of patients. A little bit like David said that um, her, we're heavily reliant on pain medications and we're able to teach them different methods of managing their pain. So therefore they're less reliant on medications. Um, we also do things like teach them that, um, about healthy eating and diet and, um, and exercise and um, different techniques that they can use when they're struggling. So um, we had a guy that um, was on strong amounts of pain medication waiting for an operation and he decided after doing the course that he didn't really need the operation and that he didn't need as many drugs because he felt so much better and felt that if he could manage his condition but with having the support from either patient education programs or his GP when he needed it that he he could he could go forward in a better way and I think that if the patient education programs were used more there would be more people like him out there I mean I see a lot of them and I see a lot of these good stories that come through I'm one of them myself I'll be honest um you know and I just think there's a resource out there that's probably underused um and it's amazing how much that can shorten a waiting list I, I i like i said i can't comment on the um who gets what and who doesn't that you know i'm not there but i certainly think that there's services out there that can be used more effectively and nurse is another one that has a huge results yeah. Yeah. That, that's really helpful to you you know your perspective on it how what people are expecting may have been an operation but sort of treatment and prevention and therapy might often be a, a better option for them they hadn't considered. We've got about four minutes left session, so if I can ask Glenn and Camilla for sort of a brief answer to that, and if that's yeah. okay. So, like so, so my, mine will be very brief and, and I'm agreeing with uh, what David said. Um, these decisions need to be clinically led. They need to be evidence-based and the people who know the evidence and they know the, the impact of the treatments and the procedures and also who know the, um, the circumstances around individuals are the clinicians at the front line who are seeing these patients all the time. So we've got, to, we've got to work hard to construct a mechanism whereby we can get feedback from clinicians on a specialty by specialty basis that we can work with general practice feeding into that because often what we don't do in the hospital just puts a load in, in general practice. So it needs to be a joint debate around this, but to decide um, where the best impact will be on the capacity that we have. And I think it's less probably a money problem I just think it's our theatres, we need to know how we want to use them to best effect. Our clinics, we need to know how to use them to best effect. So it's a capacity driven issue rather than a money issue in my mind, but frontline clinical staff um, need to be involved. Thanks very much. And finally, Camilla. Yep, I would agree with everything that Len, David and Jules have said. And actually, it needs to be a combination of all those things, doesn't it? In addition to which, um, a, a way of looking through our systems and pruning out things that are redundant, like some of those trips that Jules was talking about earlier, those four unnecessary trips. Um, and I would suggest my proposal would be that we have an all Wales task force, actually, that develops mm. a strategy and actually runs this on an all Wales basis because there will be um, opportunities in one health board that another health board doesn't have, and they may be able to swap, you know, uh, facilities or swap space. And we think about whether, you know, can we get our operating theatres running more efficiently, running the staff, we get it, you know, all that. And if we can do it as an all Wales um, activity, I think we we'll have more chances. Of, of succeeding. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for, for your answers. They're really interesting, and we could, you know, probe all of them in a, in a lot more. Depth. We've got a short amount of time left in this section, so I'm going to be cheeky and use the chair's prerogative and, and go to David for the next question only, if that's okay with everyone. He, as he's literally been at the centre of the storm, really, through through COVID. I think a lot of the challenges we've talked about and issues have raised through the panel here today have been evident as problems for some time. And I think we talked about access to patient records, people's own responsibility for their health. There's lots of changes I think we could probably all agree on. 
David, what's the catalyst? What's really going to make them happen going forward? What's your advice or the challenge you're going to put to everybody else going forward? How do we make these things actually happen, the things we've talked about? That's a great question. Um, I think that I think we need to break down barriers. There's lots of good people doing lots of good work throughout the NHS, and but they're not necessarily aware that each other are doing the same thing. There's probably some duplication across the board, um, and I think work breaking down the traditional barriers in terms of between primary care and, and secondary care, getting better dialogues going there. And I know there has been quite a lot of work in Swansea um, to do with that. Um, but also between um, between health boards as well. So, you know, the fact that you can actually do collaborative work in cross sites, you know, even looking at potentially, you know, employing people to regions rather than just to health boards. Um, you know, we certainly saw a lot of um, consultants moving between different critical care units moving to, to help, you know, as part of mutual aid, you know, where other, other units were short. And actually that that allows you to bring the expertise of people from a different area into into a you know into a very different place so you you could bring um people from the tertiary unit and the neurosurgical unit into some of those smaller dghs and, and there's cross-pollination there and, and 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 sharing of ideas and clinical experience so i think that um just really allowing people to to talk more and to actually f to facilitate that and I, th I think that you know things like this commission um and and um you know, having all Wales panels and task force with very clear deadlines and very clear purposes. Nobody wants bureaucracy for the sake of it and, you know, nebulous groups that never do anything. But um, I think, you know, if you look at some of the task and finish work that's been done by the critical care group recently, um, looking at, you know, things like projected beds and, and, and how we need to upscale ITU in, in Wales to, to make it fit for the, for the next 20 years. Um, as long as you have the right stakeholders and you actually have a appropriate and realistic deadline people will produce stuff but i think i think again it will need some um hands-on from people within the various specialties to actually you know organize and, and and facilitate that but i think the more the and obviously the other huge thing is actually talking to to patients and and outcomes has been a you know a, a thing that we've looked at for a long time and and things like standardized mortality rate in itu who dies who survives but actually what's much more interesting and much more important are patient uh, reported outcomes and family reported outcomes and that's that's you know we haven't looked at that as at that for long as a measure of are we doing the right thing but actually it's much more sensitive and it gives much more idea of, of are you being effective um if you if you look at those sort of measures um as a measure of success if you like thanks thanks very much david and we, we could have listened for a lot longer and thanks to all of the panel for your, it all come from your unique perspectives and very clear the depth of knowledge and, and the passion you all have for the subject Listening in the wing, so to speak, metaphorically rather than literally, if we've got two uh, expert, an expert listening panel, I go as far as to describe them. Uh, Professor Vivian Hartwood, who's chair of Powys Health Board and also chair of the NHS Confederation, so I need to be on my best behaviour. And Donna Coleman from Howell Law Community Health Council. I'll just come to you both really, for, I'll come to, to Donna first if that's happy for some thoughts on reflections on what you've heard from the panel. Yeah, I think it's been a, a really interesting discussion. And I think to to pin it down to if I if I could construct a Venn diagram, for me there are three interacting circles here. The first one is the people and the patients. There's been lots of discussion about trusting patients, um, empowering patients, educating patients, and recognizing that people and patients live in communities who are part of that and in those communities there are schools there are church groups but still everybody is also an individual but i think we need to look at harnessing the power that individuals have um, and we've heard lots about as i say the community side of things the second part of my uh, sort of venn diagram that i sort of used to capture the discussions looks at mindsets 
um, that is something that has to change. We're in a world that's changing an awful lot at the moment. We've heard so much about that. Um, and we need to look at embracing this change as very much an opportunity. But the other words that I also heard were being agile, being brave and having to make choices and there being challenges. There were some things in terms of mindsets that needed to decrease. And those were things like paternalism, but on the other hand, there needed to be an increase in honesty and investment and a decrease in bureaucracy. I think key to this, there was also a thread of IT and digital technology being a way of it enabling things to happen differently. And, and the third thing that I think I heard an awful lot about was collaboration. So, you know, we've got people and patients, we've got mindsets, we've got collaboration. And again, this was down to losing the divide between for example, the GP sector and the acute sector, which can be assisted by technology, particularly if bureaucracy is de decreased. Yeah. Having the joined up health and social care, um, that will attempt to reduce inequality if again, it's tackled through IT and done through communities and by health boards working together, schools and communities, etc. So those were the three sort of elements I picked up. Thanks very much, Donna, and I'm sorry to, je to gesture, just conscious of time. I, I think the collaboration point, and as you've described it, is, a, is an excellent one, really, between what we, you know, in within health or primary care, secondary care, community care, tertiary care, it doesn't mean much to anybody who's a patient. It's about the care they get and how the system works together and also bringing social care into that as well. Viv, some initial reflections from you. Yes, Pranamda, it's been a pleasure and a, a actually a privilege to listen to the speakers today. Um, and I couldn't help reflecting that it was Einstein who first told us that in the midst of every crisis, there is great opportunity. And that clearly came over from what our speakers were saying. Um, I was able to understand very fully indeed how we are actually at the moment learning to take opportunities of all kinds, which is, is great. Um, and now the position is that we're going to have to learn how to progress those to get on with it and make progress um, so for example um, you know we've been trying for many years now well it seems many years to integrate health and social care working um, but it's only the pandemic which has actually driven us to that and it's amazing to see how well we're working together for example over the vaccination programs with healthcare staff working alongside social care staff. Um, ironically, actually, this morning, uh, Matt Hancock, um, in essence, commented that it's not in spite of the pandemic, but because of it, that we're going to have reforms in NHS England. Uh, he, he failed to uh, mention, of course, that we have had these reforms in Wales in place for some time, also in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, but, um, you know, we have to recognise that we are ahead of the game. Um, but I also heard today, um, sadly, really, about the awful pressure on a NHS staff, and we know about it. And of course, without our amazing staff, the NHS would be nothing. Um, and of course, there's a great need to support our staff um, across the whole system, uh, but recognising that those working in, in the most intense areas of the service, where the physical and emotional pressure is the greatest, are among those who will need the most support. Um, and as time passes and we adapt to the way in which COVID mutates and spreads and so on, uh, on we must never lose uh, the sight of the need to, to nurture and support our staff, as well as our patients. Both are extremely important. Um, if we look at that old World War One propaganda poster, you know, what did you do in the Great War, Daddy? Um, well, our grandchildren, your grandchildren, those of you who are working on the front line, might be asked the same thing. What did you do in the Great Pandemic? And I'm very conscious that people working in management will never actually be able to answer with the same conviction um, as those working right at the heart of it. However, their contribution to strategy, planning and policy are extremely valuable, as, as we've seen and heard today. Uh, but I'm just wondering whether there are any, any unanswered questions still to be explored arising from what we've heard. And bearing in mind the title of today's meeting, which was doing things differently, delivering health and social care services prudently in Wales 2021 and beyond. So um, 
you know, how can we, for example, fast, get on with it, um, deal with, uh, deal effectively with the moral dis distress in medicine, which has been amplified by the pandemic. There was a, an excellent article in the BMJ in January about that. Um, should we be engaging more with ethicists when considering difficult decisions about prioritization uh, in order to support um, clinical and policy leaders um, to contribute to the discussion? Um, should we be engaging more in the public? Should be with the public? Should we be more honest with them? And yeah, uh, could we be respecting patients more? Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I would first of all, then, before I finish, uh, draw your attention to the CMO's excellent report produced last week, uh, which he focuses on what happened in the first phase of the pandemic and makes recommendations. I'm delighted to say, for me, the most important one was to continue to monitor health inequalities and identify solutions, which people have talked about, our speakers have talked about today. So in conclusion, I'm going to turn from one genius to another, from Einstein to Shakespeare, uh, who never lets us down, of course. Uh, and I'd like to emphasize that managers and policymakers are the very people who must seize the moment and drive reform as time is passing, uh, leaving the staff who are working directly with patients to get on with the important job. So to hard pressed executives and independent members of boards uh, and people working in health and social care management, I would say in words of Shakespeare taken from Julius Caesar, which you probably will know, there's a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. So that, that's my final conclusion from everything I've heard today. Let's get on with it. Thank you. Thanks very much for everyone. I think I wasn't expecting this afternoon with Shakespeare, I have to say, but uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, it comes to me to uh, sum up. Thanks very much to, to Viv and Donna and the panel. It's been an excellent discussion and it's been a real challenge keeping it time with, with quite a series of questions from uh, those people who were, who were attendees today that we could have gone into a lot more depth on. I think reflecting back to the so the start of the meeting in the video sort of some really stark numbers in that about how massive this covid pandemic has been how you know so many people have sadly lost their lives uh, some people still in hospital we've got a third of the people in hospitals in wales today uh, suffering from covid the scale of the waiting lists the challenges ahead you know we've got some way to go it was brilliant to hear from from the, the panel from how what primary care can do differently what can be done for patients and I think that the one that sort of stuck home for me was I first got involved in health and regulation about 15 years ago, and we were having similar conversations about what access people should have to patient records at that point. Everyone called it the GP record, then how that was opened up, whether it should be pharmacists, but great to see a sort of general agreement that the patient record belongs to the patient and help them look after themselves. Thanks very much today now to the, to the Bevan Commission not the foundation, as I said at the start, and other partners, Social Care Wales, uh, the Institute of Welsh Affairs and Community Health Councils for supporting this event. Thanks to Alison Helen and the team and, and Chris Martin at the Bevan Foundation. Thanks more importantly to all of you who took part. I haven't been able to see the, the complete list and I haven't been to see the pictures of people taking part. I was really looking forward to doing my working man's David Dimbleby and pointing at people in their general direction and trying to think of a way of describing them without causing offence, but sadly I couldn't see the panel, uh, the questioners today. So thanks all very much for attending this event. It's the second in a series. There is another event next week where you can find the details from the Bevan Commission uh, website. Thanks for all taking part and thanks to the Bevan Commission for, for the event today. Thanks all.